Today, we have Bob Drogan, who's written a book about Curveball. Uh, it's really a hard-to-believe story of an Iraqi defector who fabricated intelligence and wound up being recited on the floor of the United Nations by Secretary of State Colin Powell as part of the justification for the invasion of Iraq. Bob is a national security and intelligence reporter for the Los Angeles Times and has been for the past nine years, covering what he calls nukes, kooks, and spooks. Uh, in March 2004, Bob broke the story of Curveball. Uh, it's the kind of story you would expect from a seasoned reporter, uh, and that's exactly what Bob is. He's been at the LA Times for a couple of dozen years. The decade before taking on intelligence, he was a foreign correspondent reporting on Nelson Mandela's election as president of South Africa, the genocide in Rwanda, the Persian Gulf War, and other news from nearly 50 countries in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. He's a native from nearby, I guess 50 miles north of Bayonne. He dropped out of college to backpack in Asia for a year and later hitchhiked to Alaska. He graduated from Oberlin College where he once took a course in bowling, and yes, he passed. <laughs> I think, was that an A? <laughs> I'll pass fail. He received uh, his master's uh, degree from uh, Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, not the better Columbia in Missouri where I'm from, which is now number one, in case you hadn't noticed. Bob has won or shared numerous journalism awards, including the Pulitzer Prize, an Overseas Press Club Award, two Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Awards, and a George Polk Award. Some might want to ask Bob, why didn't he uncover this intelligence flaws before the war began? Uh, I want to hear his answer too, but I hasten to add that Bob is working in a field that's always been difficult, has become even harder after 9-11, and has become increasingly treacherous for reporters. At least, at least two investigations about alleged illegal leaks to journalists are still ongoing in Washington today. I can say that I think we're all grateful to have reporters like Bob Drogan who continue to work in this field and thankful that the media, that there are media companies out there still willing to devote the considerable resources to covering it. We're lucky too to have this new book on Curveball to outline many of the intelligence failures leading up to the war. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Bob Drogan of the Los Angeles Times. Thank you, thank you all very much. I'm uh, delighted and honored to be here. I have to say, having grown up in Bayonne, New Jersey, I don't remember weather this bad. I don't uh, know what's happened down here. Um, I am grateful for that kind introduction. Uh, as Jim said, I write about uh, intelligence and national security. Uh, the case I've written about that I want to talk about fascinates me um, because I think it's unique in the annals of intelligence. Um, I've spent the last three years trying to unravel this case, uh, not just because it's a wild story, but because I think it uh, helps really is the key to understanding. It's the defining story of how we got into Iraq. Um, I hope you find it of interest, not least because I want you to write a, buy my book. Um, it's really about how intelligence works and how intelligence in this case doesn't work. Uh, how a $45 billion a year system in this case made us less safe, not more. Um, Curveball was the code name, as Jim said, of uh, an Iraqi engineer, a chemical engineer who defected to Germany in 1999. Uh, he was given this wonderfully prescient code name. Uh, I'd like to think it was uh, that, you know, it was somebody being very witty. In fact, it was just one of these wonderful accidents of history. There was a defense intelligence agency team based in Munich, uh, and they were handling, uh, they'd been there through the Cold War. The, uh, when Soviet defectors came out, uh, among the code names that were used, there were cryptonyms. Uh, the word ball was the crypt used for Soviet defectors with uh, weapons information. They dusted off the old playbook. Uh, there'd been a match ball, there'd been a snowball. Curveball was the next up, uh, and 
we're lucky that it was. Um, the case is unique because I think um, without the information from Curveball, the United States would have had a very hard time making the case that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And I know that's a broad thing to say, but let me explain. Um, we know this because of after the war, the, all of the investigations that looked at the pre-war intelligence system concluded that without Curveball's information, there really was no case to be made that Saddam had biological weapons. There are three, there were three essential cases to the, to the claims for the war, the justification for the war, having to do with weapons of mass destruction, that is chemical, nuclear, and biological. All of the biological weapons intelligence came from Curveball. Without him, they said there was none. It turned out that the chemical weapons information that the analysts at the CIA who were looking at their information, the satellite photos, procurement records, and the rest, were very unsure with what they had and were, quote, drifting. They thought it was ambiguous. They really didn't know what it had. But they knew that before the 1991 Gulf War, when Saddam really did have these illicit weapons programs, he had a very large, very robust chemical weapons program um, that uh, was extensive in the country. He had a much smaller, much more experimental biological program. It only really got ginned up shortly before the Persian Gulf War. The production only began a few months before the Gulf War, had very limited production run. What the chemical weapons guys, when they saw the estimates coming out from the biological weapons guys in the CIA in the several months before the war, and they saw that they were so absolutely sure because of curveball that Saddam had biological weapons and was producing them at, a, at an unprecedented rate, claiming that, his infra that it was larger, more robust, more sophisticated than before the Gulf War. The chemical guys said, well, if he's got that, he must have the chemical weapons as well, the nerve gas and the poison gas, mustard, mustard and blister gases. Um, the, I'm sorry, blister and, and nerve gases. And so they ramped up, they increased their own estimates to what Saddam had as well. So essentially the second leg, if you will, of the, cl the claims against Saddam were also resting on curveball shoulders. He said nothing particular about nuclear weapons, but for those of us who are watching this closely, and, and, and Jim you know, raised the question of why didn't reporters do a better job before the war, well, some of us, you, you know, we, we can discuss as to how well different people did. I think there's a case to be made that they were, it was uneven out there. Um, but for those of us who are watching closely, it was very clear before the war that Saddam had no nuclear program. On March 7th of 2003, that is be about two weeks before the war, Mohammed El Baradai, the head of the Atom International Atomic Energy Agency, went up to the UN Security Council and said, we've been to all of the places where Saddam, where, where we think Saddam may have had these programs. We've talked to all of the scientists. We've looked at all of your intelligence. It ain't there. And by the way, the papers that you gave us about uranium from Niger, it's, quote, not authentic, meaning forged. It was clear, the only one really claiming that even the CIA wasn't saying Saddam had these weapons. Uh, they disagreed very strongly with what Dick Cheney was saying at the time. Mostly I think this case is unique, however, not just because they were wrong, but you know, after 9-11 we heard that uh, the problem was that the CIA and the law enforcement community had, quote, failed to connect the dots, that they had failed to detect the various threads in the tapestry that might have been uh, isolated to prevent the attacks. In the curveball case, what we saw is that they literally made up the dots. They piled mistakes upon misjudgments, upon mistranslations, upon miscommunications, upon misinterpretations, and so on. And in the end, they conjured up a weapons system that did not exist and had never existed. Curveball's entire story was a hoax. It was a con. It was a fraud with the most mundane of goals. He wasn't trying to overthrow Saddam. He wasn't trying to start a war. He wasn't trying to install an Islamic republic or anything of that kind. He wanted a visa. He wanted political asylum. He told lies to get political asylum. He was a schlub, a nobody, a low-level guy, a refugee who told lies to get asylum. Um, I found he is, uh, the way I think of him is, uh, he's, a, he's a simple man who gets caught up in events outside of his control. Other people twist and magnified his information and he winds up having this extraordinary impact on history because he winds up providing the chief pretext for the war.
So why did we believe him and what really happened here? He was a chemical engineer, as I said, he came out, he originally claimed he'd embezzled money and he couldn't go back to Iraq. After a few weeks, he was sitting in a place called Zerndorf, which was a, um, uh, a refugee center outside of Nuremberg in Germany, uh, originally built by the Nazis, six foot thick stone walls, it looks like a prison, and he basically said, I want out of here. When the German intelligence service, the BND, the Federal Intelligence Service, came knocking, as they do every time they get a new refugee going in there, he began to talk about weapons of mass destruction. Germany is the hub of uh, immigration of, of refugees in Europe. It has more liberal uh, policies than any of the other countries. It gets more uh, refugees than all the rest of Western Europe combined. It was a long line for asylum seekers, and he wanted to jump the line, and that's what he did. He told them that he had worked on this program uh, that had been long rumored by weapons inspectors that there were these mobile uh, laboratories, these mobile trucks, and on the back of them he began to sketch out designs for fermenters and for spray dryers and a variety of other equipment that he said were there. But because he was a chemical engineer and not a biologist, he really didn't know a lot of the details, and the German authorities helped him. They filled in the gaps so that his information would look good. His argument was, or the fear was, that these trucks were sort of a nightmare because it, they could drive from place to place. They could spew out anthrax or botulinum toxin or any of these other things, and they would disappear you know, at, at a heartbeat. You wouldn't be able to tell where they are because there are thousands of trucks parading around. And they, this idea that he told them once that there were spray dryers on that you could basically, they could produce these, um, uh, these lethal agents with the kind of specificity and the um, uh, gr grinding them down so that it would be like in a, an asthma inhaler became very terrifying. During the 1990s, several UN inspectors had speculated about these trucks. They had launched raid after raid to look for them. They never found any evidence, but the bioweapons analysts at the CIA were convinced that they existed. Uh, Curveball's account, his so-called uh, information as transmitted by the Germans, convinced them that they were confirmed to them what they already believed. Unfortunately, it didn't work the other way around. That is, nobody at the Defense Intelligence Agency or the CIA made any real effort to verify what Curveball had said. Instead, they made excuses. And I'll give you a couple of examples. After he began to, uh, after he was granted asylum, Curveball began to change his story. Suddenly, he claimed he forgot details and he denied some of the things that he previously had said, and he became increasingly vague. And suddenly, he was no longer the manager of the project, he was just a trainee engineer. And suddenly, he said he never saw anybody operate these trucks, he had just heard about them. And suddenly, he began to lowball his own importance, saying he was just a trainee engineer, not a big shot. Uh, and he admitted that a lot of his information was second or third hand, uh, so called water cooler gossip, is what he said. But instead of deciding that he was a flake and pulling the plug on this guy, the intelligence authorities agreed that, well, all defectors lie, and therefore he must be telling the truth because instead of exaggerating his story, he was undermining it. He was underballing it, lowballing it. Um, so rather than embellishing his importance, he was trying to underestimate it. And therefore, that, in their view, that made him legitimate and more credible. The way I think of it is, um, well, let me give you another example. Kerpel had said he worked at a site called Jerfal Nadaf, uh, and the satellite pictures showed that there were these buildings laid out in, in an L-shaped pattern, and that there was a wall around them. And he had said the trucks could only access the building that was a, to be used as a docking station in a certain way. And the satellite photos showed that a wall had been built around that building in 1997. And um, when the evidence for that wall was presented to the analysts, they said, well, there must be a hole in the wall, or Saddam built that wall to deceive the satellites, or uh, they knocked the wall down at night and put it back up in the daytime, you know, so we can't see it. Um, all of which, you know, all of which is entirely possible, but what it, w the only way I can look at it is it reminded me of medieval clerics searching for witchcraft. Um, they kept finding evidence everywhere they looked, and the lack of any actual proof became proof itself that these things must exist and that Saddam was hiding them. Um, the Germans played a, a major role in all of this. They refused throughout to let the Americans or British intelligence interview Curveball. Um, they refused until very late in the game to review, uh, release any transcripts of their interviews. So what we got instead was 
the German analysis of their own interviews um, in German, of their interviews which were conducted in Arabic, then were translated into English, and then that analysis was, was reanalyzed, reformatted, commented, sent up through channels, and moved up through the system. And as it passed up this chain, it became like a children's game of telephone. It just kept changing shape until by the time we get to um, first the President of the United States in his State of the Union speech, but more importantly in 2003, more importantly Colin Powell when he's at the United Nations in February of 2003, shortly before the war, he says we have this eyewitness and he has worked on these trucks and he has seen people die and he's done this and he's done all that. Not only did, did that never happen, but it wasn't even what Curveball had said. The story had morphed and changed at different levels as it had moved up this chain of command. The, the German refusal to, the CIA ultimately blamed German authorities for this, saying, oh, they refused to let us talk to him. And, and it's, when I tried to ex understand this, it, it was fascinating because there were two reasons involved. First, um, Kerbal said that the trucks had contained German-made equipment. Um, and uh, that was potentially very embarrassing uh, during the 1980s, or during the 1990s, rather, when there were investigations into Saddam's earlier WMD programs, it turned out that German companies had been the, the chief supplier. They were by no means the only supplier, but they were the, by, the, by far the largest suppliers to Saddam's 1980s programs for chemical and nuclear programs especially. The Gerhard Schroeder government at the time in the run up to this war was, uh, didn't want anything linking them, uh, linking them here. Secondly, the relations between the CIA and the German intelligence, the BND, were poisonous, uh, is the only word for it. During the Cold War, the Americans had treated them really as an adjunct service that could not be trusted, uh, and there was good reason for that. They were totally penetrated by uh, East Bloc, Soviet, East German agents, but still, even now, we're in 1999, where the Cold War has long been over, and there is this lingering distrust and lingering resentment about the Americans, and to a certain extent, there was pride of service, and they basically decided to keep Curveball under wraps for spite. To add to that is because everything in the end is personal. The head of the German, the, the cabinet officer who was the head of the intelligence, in charge of the intelligence service, his previous job had been as chief of the police in Hamburg. He was a cop at heart. He'd risen up through law enforcement. He viewed intelligence, off, intelligence operations, and the CIA in particular, as criminals. This whole idea of renditions which were starting to happen after 9-11, uh, which he was aware of because the CIA was, was operating on German soil, the whole idea of how the CIA was operating struck him as an utter anomaly. German laws were very strict on certain things no wiretaps and, you know, without extensive court approvals and, um, uh, you know, they ban uh, polygraph tests. They consider that sort of basically barbaric Nazi-style science of, you know, chicken scratches on a, on, a, on a piece of paper. They're very strict. Beyond that, this guy who was the former chief of police in Hamburg took it as a personal affront when after 9-11 the, the Bush administration, in, fact, in part, blamed the German authorities for the Hamburg cell, right? We all remember three of the four hijackers had lived in Hamburg for a while. Well, they then moved to the United States and they lived here openly, right? All of the hijackers were very open. They had bank accounts, they flew on planes, they, they stayed in hotels, they got credit cards and whatnot. And yet, if we, we all remember, it was the Hamburg cell that did this. And it was basically, they, he viewed it and he took it as an absolute insult that he was being essentially blamed for the 9-11 attacks. And so, in part, this was his saying, you know, up yours. You're not getting this guy, access to this guy. On the other hand, the Germans did not th openly admit at the time that Kerbal had had a nervous breakdown, that he had run away several times, that he was drinking heavily, that he suffered uh, emotional and mental problems, uh, that he would go into screaming fits, uh, uh, crying fits. They were very protective of him. Ultimately, they put him into a uh, witness protection, pro or, sorry, defector protection program, where he still is. Uh, they paid, got him a house, uh, brought his wife out, changed his name, and gave him a stipend. Uh, he still hasn't learned German very well and uh, still can't hold a job. Once the information got into the U.S. channels, he was being in, uh, most of his interrogations took place in uh, 2000 and uh, 2001. They ended before 
Uh, once this information uh, came into the U.S. channels, at first it had no impact. After 9-11, within three weeks of 9-11, the climate of fear in Washington changed the way all of this was suddenly being looked at. Someone took it, took it out of a safe, and for the first time, the caveats that had been in the classified intelligence reports, things that said, well, Saddam might have this, he could be going this way, he, uh, it's, you know, it's possible he may uh, uh, move in this direction. Suddenly those all disappeared and suddenly it was just said flat out, Saddam has these weapons, has these programs. Uh, all of the information was seen in a new light. In October of 2002, uh, so we're now a year after the 9-11 attacks, the, um, the president, uh, the vice president has already said Saddam, there's no doubt Saddam has these weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the, there's a, a, troops are being moved into theater. Uh, the president has gone to the United Nations, uh, given a very bellicose speech. Uh, Senate Democrats asked to see the latest uh, estimate, national intelligence estimate on, uh, on Iraq. And it turns out there was none. A national intelligence estimate is the product of the entire national intelligence community, now 16 agencies, but you take, it's basically the six or seven largest uh, uh, foreign intelligence agencies and get together and it's usually a very extensive deliberative process. Uh, under normal circumstances, it takes anywhere from six to 10 months. It can take over a year. Drafts get pushed back and forth. There's debate, there's, there's a great deal of work. The Iraq NIE was done in 19 days. Uh, and in that, for the first time, Curveball's information takes center stage, says flat out, this is the strongest stuff that we have. In some ways, it's, um, it's, it was fascinating, I found, to go back and try and, and deconstruct how it is they were saying. One of the things that the NIE said was that the program was larger and more sophisticated than the Gulf War, before the first Gulf War. And the way that they reached that conclusion, it turned out, was that they had guessed how much it was Curveball's single truck could produce, even though he, never, he admitted he had never actually seen it produce anything. Then they multiplied it by the six other trucks he said he had heard about, but never actually saw. And then they multiplied that with the assumption that these trucks could run nonstop for six months around the clock. Why six months and six weeks? I, I don't know, but anyone who's been to Iraq knows nothing runs nonstop for six months. <laughs> the point of all of this is what a, someone at the CIA said, this, the, the, the term they use up there, this was a wag, a wild ass guess. Um, it was sheer nonsense. Um, and most importantly, of course, the trucks didn't exist. The important part of what the NIE was, um, after the war, when um, people were saying, oh, the NIE was very important, the CIA said, well, you know, nobody in Congress really read it. You know, we produced this big document and only six, you know, the, the, the logs show only six members of Congress really went back and read it, which is probably true. Shows what Congress does. Um, but what its real importance was that it was the absolute template when, when Colin Powell went out to, was asked to give a speech at the, at the UN General Security Council. He went out and he spent four days out at the CIA. Um, the, the vice president had personally asked him to speak, to, gave him a 48-page document and asked him to, to deliver it. And he said, it, looked at it and said, it was much too long, it would take him three days. And, you know, Cheney said, well, let them do it. And Powell, as he put it to me, said, we had a thin-lips moment. Uh, he said, you know, even he couldn't listen to himself speak for three days. But he, they wasted an entire first day going through this White House-generated document that was largely unsubstantiated rumor, uh, allegation, um, charges that the CIA did not support. They finally literally threw it in the trash and um, the head of the CIA then said, let's go back and use the NIE. This is the best thing we have. This is our gold standard. That became the template for his speech. But still, Powell insisted that he wanted to verify everything, that he only wanted to use the absolute best stuff. And as he told it to me, the information on Curveball was presented to him as the absolute most incontrovertible material they had. So we all remember those, certainly I do, I was there and I think all of us do, when he spoke at the UN and he had these giant, I'm sorry, am I not speaking? When we, he spoke at the UN and he had these giant Fo uh, pictures behind him, what he called cartoons, these pictures of trucks. Um, these trucks, of course, they were not photographs. These were 
pictures that were drawn by CIA artists based on all of these Arabic to German to English translations in the, uh, that had come through the system. But one of the, what Powell said, a couple of things that were quite remarkable. He said that the, um, the weapons that, according to the eyewitness, meaning curveball, um, they had to produce, they could only work from Thursday night until fr through Friday because it was the Muslim holy day and they were afraid the inspectors, uh, they knew the inspectors wouldn't come on that day and therefore they would have to shut things down the rest of the week. Well, they obviously hadn't checked with the inspectors because in fact inspectors did work on Friday specifically because it was the Muslim holy day, but more to the point, you couldn't produce anthrax in an afternoon. It's just sort of not the way the system works. It would take much, much more time. The pictures he showed of these trucks with canvas sides, if you remember. Well, anyone who's been in 10 minutes in Iraq and knows these gravel roads with you know, bathtub-sized potholes, you have to look at that and say, there are no containment systems in these trucks. What happens if they hit a goat? What happens if they turn over? What happens if they get into an accident? What, you know, does this pass the giggle test? Um, and I don't think it did. Um, there was a fierce battle within the CIA that fall. The head of the European division and some of his aides went to the mat to warn higher-ups that the BND, the Germans had not verified Kerbal's information. They suspected he was a liar, a fabricator. Um, uh, both the German and British intelligence set cables to that effect, warning the CIA that his information was unconfirmed. Um, the analysts were the most fervent supporters of Kerbal, saying his information was the most credible. The higher-ups, however, uh, sided with the analysts and ignored the warnings. Uh, as the then head of the clandestine service told me that the leadership was convinced that the war was going to happen and they could tap dance nude up and down Pennsylvania Avenue and it wasn't going to stop the invasion. Um, more to the point, they thought, they knew that not all of the intelligence was correct, because intelligence never is, but they never considered that all of it might be wrong, which in this case it was. And they were convinced that as soon as they got to Baghdad and they found the first trench or the first warehouse full of pointy-ended things with a skull and crossbones on it, uh, that TV cameras would come in and no one would know, remember the mistakes that would happen, the parts that were wrong, including curveball. Um, a couple of days after Powell's speech, the UN inspectors went to the site that curveball had mentioned. They dug up the floors, they x-rayed things, they took DNA samples, they took wipes and swipes, they took 60 photographs, they went to the six other sites that he had identified, they did the same thing there, they found absolutely no information to support his story, they found things that he claimed, he, he said there was a buried room, that you know it was a secret room, well they found what it was, was a, the kind of thing you know in a, in a garage you know to, to uh, change the oil on the crankcase of your car, it wasn't a secret room. He had talked about a wall that could move, the wall was perfectly solid. He had talked about uh, another garage door, again the wall was, there was just sort of no evidence to back his thing up. But we you know go to war, uh, three weeks later all the guys in the chem bio suits, everyone obviously worried about this. And the Pentagon sets up this crazy unit to find that they figure they're just going to stumble on these weapons. They're just going to find them. There's absolutely no attention being paid to details. So the CIA gets called in. And when they don't find anything, it's fascinating to me how the agency operated. Um, the chief, the head of the, one of the guys who was in charge of the unit that was looking for curveball and looking to, for his information was what he called, he called himself a true believer and he had really been one of the people who had argued most strongly in favor of the claim that there were these weapons. And after he's been in Iraq a couple of months and he decides that the whole thing is a hoax and a fraud, he goes back and he's just as determined, he's just as zealous, and he goes back and he's determined to bring truth to power. And the way they responded to him was they, sort of like the old Soviets, they told him he needed to seek counseling. And he went to his office and found somebody else sitting there and told he had been reassigned to the visitor center. Um, it, you know, it was a very vindictive kind of thing. He was eventually transferred out. Um, the next month when David Kay, who was, had been the head of the Iraq survey group, came back and, and essentially made the same argument, uh, he discovers that his parking place is no longer in front of the um, uh, executive office but is you know, a mile or so away across a parking lot. Uh, he's, uh, instead of having an office down the hall on the seventh floor down the hall from the executive suite from 
George Tennant, he's on another floor at the end of a hall filled with construction material. He's the only guy there. There's no phone. There's no computer. He's not invited to meetings. Um, and he quits and goes public and says that we were all wrong. The CIA finally got to interview Curveball in March of 2004. They had never, up until that point, interviewed him. It's a year after the war, uh, a year after the invasion. They decide he's a fabricator. They put out a burn notice, and they pull back all of his reporting, all of the claims of the weapons, of, of, of the biological weapons. But in the end, what you had was the U.S. intelligence community had taken the ravings, really, the very clever uh, fabrications of a Baghdad man who had worked part-time as a taxi driver. He'd been selling cosmetics. He'd done a variety of jobs. They amplified, they exaggerated his claims, and they ultimately provided policymakers with an excuse to go to war or with a pretext to go to war. Um, what are the lessons here? Uh, to me, one of them was how well the UN inspectors did uh, and how little credit they got for that. Uh, they really did track down an amazing amount of material through the 1990s. In this case, had we, I'm convinced, had we given them more time, uh, we would have reached a much firmer basis for people to say, wait a second, there's no, you know, the emperor has no clothes in this case. There is no infrastructure, there are no programs, uh, there are no weapons. Um, and secondly, and much more worrisome to me, is how overrated our intelligence system is. Um, what we saw here was that competing levels of secrecy actually wound up hiding the truth, not helping it. Uh, there were a number of times here where information was put out in channels and people would ask for whether the next service, the Israelis or the British, had any information that confirmed it or corroborated it, and they would come back and say, yes, you know, we have this, and we but we can't tell you who our source is on that. And it turned out it was the same source. It was an echo chamber. So people believed things that where they thought they had confirmation, but it was all coming from the same bad source. Um, you will hear from the CIA that we in the press only cover their mistakes, we only hear about their mistakes, we don't talk about their good things. Um, I can tell you that having covered or tried to cover this, uh, this community for some length of time now, um, I think that's hokum. I think that they try and do their very best to make sure we all know about their successes and they do their very best to cover up the mistakes. Um, this one is one of the biggest mistakes that I've ever seen. I'm happy to take your questions. It was just, the, yeah, sure. It wasn't just, it just wasn't uh, Cheney. It was Rumsfeld as well, as I recall, correct. Um, the issue, I think, is um, I was going to say something, and I've lost it. Sorry. Um, I'm, I, the, the climate after 9 11, I think, played a role here in a way that it might not otherwise have done in, in what you're describing. What, what I find, and there was clearly a distrust on the part of Mr. Rumsfeld and Vice President Cheney of the CIA, and there were attempts to circumvent them, especially on issues regarding 
the ostensible connection, alleged connection between Saddam and al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. What I find so remarkable about this case is it doesn't fit into that model that you're describing in the sense that this was not an alternative view that somehow superseded the legitimate view, which is what I understand, as I recall, the Team B was. It was a challenge to the, to the orthodoxy of the CIA at the time. And correct me if I'm wrong, the Team B results, in fact, turned out to be wrong. Yeah, exactly. Um, what this was, and the reason that I find this so, as I say, different and in some ways more disturbing is this was the orthodoxy. This was not, the curveball information was not coming in through a back door. It was not, you know, Rumsfeld whispering it to Cheney or Chalabi whispering it to Rumsfeld or something of that ilk. This was George Tenet representing the, the collected wisdom of the U.S. Intelligence Committee, I'm sorry, the U.S. Intelligence Community through the NIE going to the White House, going to the Senate Select Con uh, Committee on Intelligence, going to the HIPSI, and presenting this information and saying this is our best stuff and then them presenting it to the public. So it, it wasn't coming in through this, it was not an alternative view, it was the official view. Does that make sense? Iran's, Iran, you know, I've made two trips to Vienna this year. Iran's a terrible case. Uh, Iran lied for 18 years about a nuclear program that it was building. Now, you can look at that as two ways. The bad news is they lied for 18 years. The good news is 18 years, and they've still only got, you know, today 3,000 centrifuges. They're going pretty, they're not making great success. However, they did, and they have, their degree of cooperation with the IAEA has been grudging, has been incremental, and has been, according to the IAEA, insufficient. Now, at a certain point, excuse me, the Iranian regime will gain the capability of enriching sufficient uranium to the sufficient degree that they will have weapons-grade material. The, dis the problem is that, as far as I know, we are again in the situation where there is no, quote, smoking gun. The intelligence on this has been very haphazard. There are, again, bad defectors in the system. The satellites, well, we know where their programs are. There's this great suspicion out there that there is a, quote, redundant program. You can, again, argue if they had a secret program for 18 years, why would they have a second? Why would they have built a second one? I mean, they managed to keep it secret that long. But there's this fear, well, even if we get it, we're never going to really get it because they've really got a secret program. Um, I don't have any confidence in the intelligence on Iran. Um, I did. Um, there's a character uh, in my book. Um, he, he asked if it, did I found anyone who had any remorse about their role in this farce. Um, in my book, because I was dealing with quite a number of serving intelligence officers, um, in some cases I was forced to use either first names only or pseudonyms, and there's a character in the book who's a very senior officer at the BND who was very involved in this case and who was quite cooperative, very, was very cooperative with me. And he is one who feels that he doesn't, it, curiously, he didn't blame Curveball, he blamed his own service. He said, we should have done a better job, and he feels quite terribly, but again, they were, he was against the war. The, the only one, curiously enough, um, there's a, uh, a figure in the CIA, who was out of the CIA na now, named um, Tyler Drumheller, who was the chief of the European division in the clandestine service, who was really the only, he and his staff were the only ones inside the agency who were really trying to raise red flags on this case, trying to blow the whistle. And he has told me and others, um, you know, he wished he knew more, that he wished he, had he known more, he would have done more. Uh, and he feels quite badly. He says he's quite haunted by this case. The, the senior level officials, 
um, have taken a different view, at least in public. Uh, in George Tennant's book, uh, his way of dealing with the curveball case, at least as I remember reading it, was not to acknowledge the utter multiple layers of ineptitude and incompetence that led to this and the rather tawdry decision-making process and the poor leadership and the utter failure of management um, or the cover-up that, that really went on for the longest time in this case or the, or the penalizing, the vindictive attitudes of, of supervisors towards staff. His way of dealing with it is to devote seven pages to essentially attack Tyler Drumheller for not raising that flag more. Right, for, and he says, you know, we had 22 meetings and between this time, you know, between March of 2003 and July in 2004 and he should have said this and he should have filed this memo and he should have done that. And, you know, the record is not in dispute. There is no doubt. There's plenty of documentation. Tyler, Drumheller, and members of his staff did raise warnings given the information that they had. They not only did it within their own channels, took it all the way up to the head of the clandestine service, they took it certainly up to the executive officers for, for George Tennant and for John McLaughlin. They had, there was a meeting with John McLaughlin. There were a number of things that, that took place during that time frame, but at least in Tennant's book, his, his way to deal with this is to basically attack the one guy who got it right. They can't forgive him, for, for I think, for being right in this case. Oh, he was an evil man. Oh. The question was, did Saddam's behavior lead to the naivete of people in the intelligence community? I, don't think, I wouldn't characterize it as naivete. Saddam Hussein was an evil man. He was a tyrant. The world is unquestionably better off without Saddam Hussein. He, 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 he gassed the Kurds and, and built these terrible weapons. There was a lot of reason to assume the worst about Saddam Hussein. What we didn't realize was that despite the fact that the CIA had assisted Saddam during the 1980s period when it was during the war of Iraq against Iran, despite the Persian Gulf War of 1991, despite the fact that we had no-fly zones in the north and south, despite the fact that the CIA had penetrated virtually every one of the UNSCOM, the UN Special Commission inspectors teams that went into Iraq through the 1990s, to search for weapons of mass destruction and to destroy those programs. In 1998, when the inspectors were pulled out before the bombing campaign, a four-day bombing campaign by the Clinton administration, when they couldn't go back in, the CIA was blind. It had nobody. It's unbelievable how bad their intelligence was in that time frame. They just, it was like a blackout had gone. They had done such a poor job of what their job is, which is trying to, to gain understanding of how another regime works. And at that point, post-98, and then again, certainly after 9-11, there was just this assumption, well, he must have these things because he had them in the past, and we're getting all this information, and we've got this curveball guy, and we've got this guy and that guy, and even if it all doesn't match up, there must, with all this smoke, there must be fire there. Even if only 5% of it is correct, there must be something there. And I, I, I'm very sympathetic to that argument. There is, it seems to me, a certain revisionism that has taken place in, in collective thinking, or at least people I, I deal with, that we knew Saddam didn't have weapons of mass destruction, that Bush knew or Cheney knew or the CIA knew. Nobody knew. The, and, the, and the UN inspectors, Hans Blix, never said that. The debate at the UN, and I was there, was never about whether Saddam had weapons. The only person saying that was Saddam's representatives. The Germans didn't say that, the Russians didn't say that, and the French didn't say that. The question was always, where on the scale are, was he between zero, which is what he claimed, to the extent he said anything, and whatever you want to put at the top end, a smallpox or a nuclear weapon or, or something. There are lots of things in between on that scale of capabilities and intentions and infrastructure and staffing and procurement and, and programs and, uh, you know, and, and arsenals and stockpiles and whatever. 
and, what to, and more importantly, what to do about it. The debate at the UN was not about whether he had them. And certainly there was never a debate about this in the US Congress. There was virtually no debate at all. It was about what do we do about it? Do you strengthen inspections? Do you, uh, uh, you know, do we do more with overflights? Uh, do we do more, you know, do we stiffen our sanctions? You know, the oil for food program was a joke. How do we best handle this? So the question was never about Saddam. I don't think anybody gave Saddam the benefit of the doubt on this one. So I, I don't think they were naive. I, 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 that would be my response. You know, there's the, the remarkable thing to me is how little accountability there's been for any of this. Um, and, and I'm not, you know, for, for heads on pikes kind of thing here. But um, uh, not just that George Tenet got the Presidential Medal of Freedom after presiding over, you know, what I'm convinced is the worst intelligence failure in our history. It's that people at, at much lower levels, it's, it's, um, it's the whistleblowers here, the people who tried to, to restrain this problem or tried to deal with it that got into the trouble. Um, and I, I don't think there was about, this was about, you know, bad people deliberately making bad decisions. I think it was on a much more fundamental human level, and it happened at lots of places that I identify in my book where somebody just says, well, this looks screwy, but he must know more than I do, right, because he signed it, so I'll just pass it on to the next guy. And you sort of have that very bureaucratic attitude. You know, my take on the CIA, it's, it's a bureaucracy like anyone else, anywhere else except they're trained to lie, cheat, and steal. Um, to answer your question, I don't have any greater confidence. I mean, the, the, re, the adding of the uh, director of you know, the DNI's office uh, seems to me it's just a new layer of, of bureaucracy in that system. Um, uh, I haven't seen anything, certainly on Iran, which is the only case I've been looking at, that suggests we've got it better this time around. But these are tough topics. So these are tough targets. These are denied areas. They're not easy to work in. We understand that. Um, but, you know, we spent 50, 45, 50 billion dollars. You, think it'd be better. They got it all wrong. You spoke with Cody Powell. Did you detect any remorse in him? Did that likely to come out sometime? I don't think remorse is the word. I think he was uh, d quite distressed at what he felt was um, the way he had been used in this case um, and angry at the fact that he felt his credibility had been put on the line you know, I'm not a personal friend of his, so I'll just tell you flat out, I, I, I'm disappointed, I'm surprised he has not come out more publicly. Um, I've read that he's going to write his own book after the Bush administration leaves office. Frankly, I'd rather le read it now. Uh, I'd like to know what he's got to say. I think, uh, you know, looking back through that period, he is arguably the only one who could have um, take an action that might have stopped this. I mean, there is a, you know, there is a tradition in this country of, of people resigning for principle. It certainly is at the State Department. Um, I think his loyalty uh, here blinded him. I don't blame him. I don't, it, what he said at the UN, when you go back and you look at that speech, and we're coming up to the fifth anniversary, so I'm sure people will look at it in detail. You know, it's, it, it, it doesn't hold up. It's just amazing how thin it, how, how it, it just, it, it crumbles in your hands, sentence by sentence. It just falls apart. They, and after the war, when they went in, they couldn't find any of these people on his intercepts. And, and uh, I talked to some of the people when he was in the room list at the CIA, and they were presenting him this information. You all remember, I mean, it, it, was, an, it was a remarkable performance. It was, you know, the CIA had not done that kind of public display since Adlai Stevenson, which has been um, held out as this great thing. All Adlai Stevenson did was had these very grainy pictures of ships and it wasn't until the Soviet ambassador confirmed those were missiles on the ships that they ever, certainly we all knew for sure that that's what it was. I mean, I wasn't there, but um, uh, that's what it was. And this time we had, they pulled back the curtain. This was like Oz, you know, it was, it was we got to hear intercepts. And, and for those of us who cover, the, you know, cover these agencies, this was like a, an amazing thing. We got to hear intercepts and, and, and there were satellite pictures and there were defector accounts and, and there was just sort of the whole panoply of, of sources and methods that, oh, we can't talk about that stuff, uh, suddenly is out there for the world to see. And guess what? It's wrong. It doesn't, it didn't add up to anything. It was just, you know, fairy dust. <coughs> Did that answer the question? I don't remember. <laughs> well, I have a question. 
Well, one of the things that everyone made very clear to me, certainly at the CIA, is one way th that it's impossible to tell if a defector is, is lying if you can't meet with them. And one of the things that was most remarkable about the curveball case was that this information that the president was citing when he was talking about a witness uh, in his uh, State of the Union speech and when Colin Powell was referring to the eyewitness, that at that point the U.S. had never interrogated him and didn't even know his name. Colin Powell didn't know that, he told me. He never, he just assumed that was the case. But, and when the CIA finally did do that, they, they declared him a fabricator. Um, that you need to, like with anyone else, sit down with someone. And they didn't even have transcripts, so they couldn't really check what he was saying. They just were working all of, all of these second and third hand analysis and extrapolations and expositions. So, um, as for the Soviet defectors, yes, there certainly were some. One of the remarkable things that, that again, that speaks to the difficulty of, of spying in these closed societies is um, we never had anyone, we, the U.S. intelligence community, they, whatever, <laughs> never had anyone inside the leadership of the Kremlin during the Cold War. We never had anyone in North Korea during the Korean War. We never had anybody I I inside that leadership. We never had anybody in the Politburo in uh, Hanoi during the, the war. Uh, I have no idea if they've ever had anybody close in on China, but certainly no one has come forward to suggest so. And obviously on Saddam, the ones they had were wrong. Um, there's a story that's been out on the internet uh, associated with Tyler Trumhauer, among others, about a defector or, or about a, uh, a source, uh, Naji Sabri, who was the foreign minister of Iraq. And uh, it's sort of a funny, an odd story where uh, he was a French informant. And um, he uh, was telling in public, saying Saddam doesn't have weapons, right? That was his job as the foreign minister. Um, when he got, th there's a story out there now that says that this was told, that, that he wanted to defect. And, in and the story is, this part of it's true, uh, that the CIA got him a special tie or a vest or something, and he was going to wear it at the UN General Assembly. Uh, when he was going to speak, or Security Council, sorry, when he was going to speak. And if he wore this, then they would know it was a signal he was going to defect. And he, and he wore it. And the, the Paris station chief chases him from here to New York to Egypt to Beijing to here and, and back into Baghdad. And then he gets the plug and says, no, the White House says, no, don't bother. And the version of it that's out on the Internet is that they said, don't bother because, in fact, Naji Sabri's story was that when he got in private, when he was meeting the intelligence, he was saying, shh, there are no weapons. Right? But that's the secret story. Well, think about that. He's saying in public, there are no weapons. Would you, get, would you pay the guy to come to you in private and say there are no weapons? Why would, why would they do that? I mean, what was the point of that? In fact, what all the post-war investigations found is he was coming in and saying, yes, there are chemical stockpiles. Yes, we th I think they're working on some bio, and uh, the new program is dead. Um, and it just, again, went to show how difficult this was. People around Saddam didn't know what he had. One of the great stories that no one has yet been able to crack is the interrogations of Saddam, right? He's dead. Um, but there's some fascinating detail in the Iraq Survey Group report um, about what Saddam believed. And there's a wonderful book to be written someday about what Saddam believed versus what George Bush believed and sort of their communication skills in both directions. Saddam believed the CIA knew, he thought the CIA was smarter than they were. He thought they knew they had no weapons. He had no weapons. And he knew, he assumed that the, that the Americans understood that the bigger threat was not his insular, secular regime, but the Iranian Shiites that were actually building nuclear <laughs> weapons next door, or trying to, uh, and were obviously his traditional neighbor. Uh, he believed that in the end, the Americans, I mean, he obviously miscalculated. He's, he was a man who miscalculated every possible, possible juncture, and he believed that this war wouldn't come because he assumed that they knew this was, this was, that the weapons didn't exist. 
Uh, when I moved to Washington, I had lunch with a guy named John Martin, who was, um, some of you may know, was a, a federal prosecutor who had um, prosecuted every espionage case in the U.S. for the federal government for the previous 25 years and had won every single case. And what he said to me that day was that the two most dangerous words in the English language are national security. He said because of the incredible abuses that take place behind the guise of national security. And he proceeded to tell me about all the cases that he won. He won all his cases because he cherry-picked the cases he wanted because he only went for cases that he could win in a court of law. And he said that the kinds of abuses he had seen by the FBI and others over the years had frightened and shocked him. Um, I don't think I've seen anything, certainly in the last several years, between the warrantless wiretapping and Abu Ghraib and waterboarding and the rest of this that gives me any greater comfort or, or any closer to that. Do I give thought to that? Absolutely. Do I? Uh, my newspaper has, has withheld uh, stories. We have, uh, in some cases, run stories. After, we, we have withheld stories after being asked not to. We have also run stories after being asked not to. Um, uh, I have never, I, I am a great believer that our society um, lives and breathes on transparency and that the secrecy uh, uh, that is brought up in these times is, is very debilitating and destructive to our society. So I, to, to answer, yes, I think of it all the time, but my, certainly my default position is it's better to share information. Americans deserve to know the truth. Well, the, the, I don't know the current number. I do know that when um, uh, David Kay uh, was in the uh, uh, Senate Armed Services Committee hearing room on January 28th of 2004, with it, when he famously said, we are all wrong, uh, we are all wrong, one of his parting comments to the, uh, to the senators who were telling him you know, to take a hike was that there were more people in that room than there were Arabic speakers in the CIA. Um, uh, when I went over and spent time with the weapons hunters, I was telling somebody earlier today, the, um, I mean, they were just dragging in Arabic speakers. You know, they were taxi drivers. They had hauled in from Detroit. They were hiring anybody. And they'd brought in the 142nd Military Intelligence Brigade from Utah, which is largely made up of uh, young men. I'm sure there may be some women. I only met young men um, who were all former Mormon missionaries who had studied abroad. Uh, and one of, one of them that I remember meeting spoke Arabic, but the others spoke, one spoke Norwegian, one spoke Urdu, uh, you know, I mean, it's just a, hod, a Portuguese, a hodgepodge of stuff, but these are the people they were bringing in for translators. They were, they were you know, it was not a, uh, how many Russian linguists were there without jobs, you know, <laughs> sorry, after the Cold War, and uh, the agency was, there is truth to the fact that, a great deal of truth, that in the post-war, post-Cold War cuts, uh, there was uh, a, a bleeding of talent. Uh, there were people trying, you remember there were some moves to in fact eliminate the CIA. Uh, there was a real question, did we need you know, an intelligence system? Um, and it was not a, you know, there was a lot more money to be made on Wall Street or Silicon Valley than there was uh, in those kinds of businesses. So I, I don't know the answer to the current number, but whatever it is, I suspect it's not enough. Um, creative ambiguity on whose part? On part of the administration. This administration. Um, I, there clearly was a predilection. I mean, uh, you know, we all the predilection to go to war against Saddam, and there was clearly an assumption that uh, they were, there was a desire to do so, um, and various scenarios were put forward to justify that. Um, I deal with the one that they used, the one that was the most public, the, the, and the one that really was a frightening and potential scenario, which was the weapons of mass destruction. I don't remember anything being ambiguous about it at all. I remember the vice president saying Saddam has nuclear weapons, and Condi Rice saying we don't want the uh, smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud, and the president of the United States uh, 
doing his State of the Union speech and speaking at the United Nations and in dozens of other places, making very frightening warnings. Um, I don't remember it being ambigu ambiguous at all. Do you? Um, it is clear that the vice president certainly exaggerated, misspoke, mischaracterized. I'll let you pick what verb you want. Sp spoke without any foundation in, uh, said, said things that at least that the CIA would not back. I have a much harder time, and I've looked, and I know others have as well, finding any place, at least as regards the weapons of mass destruction issue, not the not Al Qaeda, where I can find any light at all between what the president was saying and what the CIA was telling him was their best estimate. So at least at his level, and I'm not justifying it, he's the man, you know, he's the commander in chief. These it was a political decision to go to war. Obviously, other people had this intelligence and decided it was not worthy of going to war. This is not about whether it, to me, I, I'm not trying to defend him or say this was the right thing. I thought it was a bad idea then. I think it's obviously a worse idea now. The more we know, the worse it looks. But I don't find anything in his statements on the WMD that is different from what the CIA was telling him. That's why, to me, this story, this case, is so frightening. We're used, our system is designed through elections to deal with politicians who make bad decisions. It's even designed to make decision to deal with politicians who lie. I don't, I don't know enough about Woodrow Wilson, but I can't think of a president since certainly since, since Harry Truman who did not lie, right, on an issue of national security of one kind or another. Um, so whether to me and I, you know, whether Bush lied or not, is less, you know, he's he'll have to live with that. The question is whether it was the right decision, whether it was towards the right end for national security. And obviously, it was not. That was my way of thinking of it. Was the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee able to make a report about the Senate The question was th did the Senate Intelligence Committee add anything to it? Under um, Senator Pat Roberts, a Republican, um, uh, there was a, a uh, until the last election, there was a great reluctance to investigate some of this, uh, on the, but there, in the end, were some reports that did come out. They were quite heavily redacted, um, but must, much of that information subsequently came out in the Rob Silberman Commission hearing. So we did get access to that, the Rob Silberman Commission report. Rob, so it was uh, uh, former Governor Rob and Lawrence Silberman, a uh, uh, federal judge who were appointed by the president to investigate the, uh, the pre-war intelligence. This was one of the outcomes of the David K. testimony. Um, so I think we got a lot of access to it. Um, obviously, a lot of what the, you know, SISI does, what, what the Senate Intelligence Committee does is behind closed doors. Um, there clearly was lack of oversight. I mean, by definition here, um, there was very little attempt to push the CIA into doing a team B, for example, to looking at this from other points of view. There's, there was, the term that was used was groupthink. Everybody signed off on this. Uh, and those people who had specific objections were really pushed out of the way. Yes, it's not only they weren't willing to consider it, there's, um, there's this fascinating bit in August of 2002 when Dick Cheney went down to the Veterans of Foreign Wars uh, in Nashville, as I recall, and he says, and this is before the UN inspectors have been allowed back in, right? They don't go back until November of that year. And the vice president says, there's a great danger that they'll be allowed back in because if they do, 
they might not find anything. And we know it's there. And this will give us, quote, <laughs> false comfort. And it really, I mean, it, the, the problem was when, for the inspectors, and I got to know some of them quite well, they really, it was, a, if they had found, you know, a mobile biological weapons production facility, if they had found one of Kerbwell's trucks, if they had found a nuclear, it would have been a cause for war. My God, Saddam is producing these things in clear defiance of, of UN um, res Security Council resolutions. And the Security Council probably would have backed it at that point. In this case, their failure to find anything, you know, we had all these troops in theater, it was getting hot, you know, it was the, the, all kinds of shock and awe, it was getting late. Uh, the failure to find anything was used as the proof he's hiding it all. So uh, at, at a certain point, it didn't really matter. But that attitude, as the, pre as the vice president explained it, was, was paramount. that any policy they picked was wrong? That, that any policy a previous administration had pursued, you know, for that very reason had to have Well, certainly the Clinton, they, the Clinton administration, I don't think they ever attacked, you know, 41. Um, uh, yeah, when they came into office, it was whatever the Clintons had done, you know, they were again it. Uh, so they immediately dropped the policy on North Korea and the framework accord collapsed. And so, you know, here we are six years later and North Korea is now tested and there's another agreement that's probably less, you know, demanding than the Framework Accord was, the 94 agreement. So um, that was clearly part of the, of the attitude. Uh, you know, on the intelligence, I, it, it's a, this, these are difficult areas, obviously, for people to do. And I was telling a class earlier, there are two characters in my book who, um, who sort of expressed this from different sides. John McLaughlin, who was the um, deputy director uh, of intelligence, the number two man at CIA, is an amateur magician and um, has pictures of Harry Houdini in his office. Um, and, you know, Harry, um, George Tenney used to just introduce him as the smartest man in America. And, um, and he, he liked to practice magic tricks. And he, he considered magic a good metaphor for intelligence. He said, you know, you can't, you can't believe what you see. And there's another character in my book, a German uh, officer, quite senior, who was a student of Max Weber, the German sociologist, um, and his theories on rationalizing behavior. And, and he would quote to me, he'd said, um, you know, you, people hear what they want to hear. And sort of the, between the you can't believe what you see and you hear what you want to hear sort of defines to me <laughs> how we got into this mess and that kind of attitude. Chalabi, you know, the great charlatan. I mean, what a classic character. I, I'm of the minority view here that thinks that Chalabi's role is vastly, has been vastly overplayed by the press um, and by his opponents. Um, his biggest impact, it seems to me, was, uh, if anything, during the Clinton administration when he played a very serious role on Capitol Hill in getting the Congress to pass the resolution that made regime change official U.S. policy. You know, that, if you look at that period, if you look at that decision, it drives a lot of subsequent events. Um, the, the Senate, Select Senate Committee on Intelligence investigated Chalabi's role after the war. Again, it's one of these reports that almost nobody but me, I think, read. Uh, it's fascinating for the detail, but fascinating as well for how unsuccessful he was Depending on how you count it, there were at least six and as many as 20 defectors who were sent out by the Iraqi National Congress. All of them were deemed in one form or another to be fabricators, um, but all of them were known to be. That is, they, some of them were so bad, you know, that, oh, I'm trying to remember. One case, there was a guy who claimed to be a nuclear engineer but, you know, he didn't know anything, and, and every time he got a tough question, he would get flustered, and he would go off to the bathroom, and they finally followed him in, and he was, like, reading notes out of, out of his shoes or something, you know. Um, there was one character, Major Harith, um, who plays a role in the Curveball saga, and a, and a very unfortunate one. And Major Harith um, was a, uh, claimed to be a former, a, a major in the Mukhabarat in the uh, intelligence service. 
And he was interviewed on 60 Minutes. Uh, uh, Vanity Fair did quite a long piece on him. The New York Times did a lengthy piece on him. His story, which constantly was changing, was that he was like Zelig. He was this character who would go from Salman Pak, where he saw you know, Saddam's guys teaching Islamic terrorists how to hijack airplanes, to to Waitha, where they were, you know, training the nuclear mujahideen, to you know Fallujah, where they were, you know, were producing uh, 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 taboon and sarin gas, and and just on and on, and he just had this endless sort of stuff. And what and he was introduced by Chalabi. In fact, he was introduced into the system. Um, I want to make sure I get this right. He was in, anyway, he was brought in by Chalabi, and he and he was interrogated four times in Jordan by the DIA, which finally decided his story didn't add up. But he passed a, a polygraph test. So they put his information into the system, including his claim that Saddam had some trucks. And the way he described it, the guys had to wear suits, and they did this, and they did that, did not match up at all with Curveball's story. They, he said they were under, in an underground facility. They were parked at the Republican Palace. Um, it, it just sort of didn't match up at all. But nonetheless, it was put in the system as corroboration of Kirkwall's account. In May of 2002, there were so many questions being raised about this guy that the DIA, and there were other warnings from other services, because Chalabi's people had tried to introduce him to the British and I'm not sure where else, that they went back and they re-interviewed him and they re-polygraphed him and they decided he was a fabricator and they stamp fabricator right on the file. But the D, it turns out that the DIA system, computers are wonderful, right? You could still call up, it was like they were in separate files. You had to look up fabricator file as opposed to Major Harith's file over here, right? So in May, he's, he's, he's officially declared a fabricator, the worst possible thing in the US system. In October, he's being quoted in the National Intelligence Estimate, right? And in January, the President of the United States is citing, you know, we have multiple witnesses in the State of the Union speech, meaning Major Harith. And in February, Colin Powell is talking about his information, you know, about these trucks at Karbala and, and whatever. So there you have a case where even though the system worked, and there was, there, you know, it fell apart. Um, the Chalabi story, which uh, again we know more about because of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, his the INC was originally uh, founded with money from the CIA. Um, he was uh, a very adroit uh, user of intelligence um, and a, a passer, someone who's passed intelligence back and forth. In 19, and I, I want to make sure I have the dates right. I think in 1995 there was support that he and his allies were going to launch a coup. It was very easily, from the Kurdistan, it was very easily, against Saddam, it was very easily penetrated by Saddam's people. Lots of people were killed. The CIA then pulled their support back, gave it to the INA, to the Iraqi National Accord, which was based in London. The allegation from the CIA, and they were then to try another coup. The allegation, and I don't know the truth of this, but the allegation that the CIA made was that Saddam, that Chalabi leaked that information or somehow blew the whistle on that coup and hundreds and hundreds of people were killed. The CIA had to finally rescue hundreds and exfiltrate them to the United States, but hundreds of people who were ostensibly anti-Saddam Iraqi forces were killed. And that's why the CIA said, we want nothing more to do with Chalabi. So, in Curveball's case, that's a long answer, sorry. In Curveball's case, there was an, um, he had a brother who fled Iraq in 1992 and joined Chalabi's organization at a low level. And in 2001, there is a phone call between the two of them. And the reason we know this, Chalabi has furiously denounced me, he's denounced the Los Angeles Times, he denies any of this. The reason we know this, again, the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Rob Silberman <coughs> report confirmed this version of events. And, and I don't see any particular reason for them to add this little Philip for their own, you know, for the fun of it. The brother worked for Chalabi's organization. He calls Curveball up, says, Dr. Chalabi wants to know, you know, do you have any information on weapons of mass destruction we can give the Americans? 
Kerpold, who's estranged from his brother because one of them was stealing money back in Iraq and the other, there was some family thing going on there, hangs up on him. Sort of end of story as far as that goes. The CIA interviews the brother after we go into Iraq. They find the brother, the, the, Kerpold's mother tells them about this. They go and they interview the brother at the hunting club, which is where Chalabi had set up his organization. He tells them the story, they confirm the phone call. Now, I don't know whether, or I was told this by several people, I don't know whether they confirmed it through an intercept or just that they went back and looked at phone records. They confirmed the call had occurred. It hit the CIA like a stabbing chest pain when they discovered that there was a, conne a, potential, a potential connection between Chalabi and Kerbal. This idea that the worst defector one can imagine, the absolute worst case example, might have been foisted on them by this guy who they loathed and detested, right, was far greater than they could imagine. In the end, they decided, and the other investigative bodies decided it didn't happen that, that there was just the coincidence of the brothers, that there was no connection per se between Chalabi and Curveball. It didn't fit the pattern, the major Harith. All of these other guys had come out, they'd talked to newspaper reporters, they'd been introduced into the American system, they had gotten their information out in very clear ways. Here comes this guy, he's a refugee, he doesn't speak the curveball. He's a refugee in Germany, he doesn't speak German. He, they, you know, he says he doesn't want to talk to the Americans. Uh, he's a chemical engineer talking about biological weapons. It's sort of none of it made sense that if this is how they were trying to get the guy in, that you would go through this unbelievable system where it could fall apart at any moment. So in the end, they decided it was just coincidence. One more lightning round. That's it. Please. You know, I was not part of, this, uh, of that decision or that story, so um, I don't actually know this, the, the, I don't know the detail on that. I can tell you that the story, that one story that I know that we did run after being asked not to run um, had absolutely no impact, and it had to, basically it was a story about CIA recruiting operations among Iranians in Los Angeles. There's a big CIA station in Los Angeles, um, and there's a big Iranian community in Los Angeles, and, the, and again, this was not my decision but it was one of these thinking, thoughts that, well, the Iranians obviously know that the CIA is recruiting there. You know, that's their job. The Iranians in Los Angeles all know it because the part of the story was how public this was. It was basically any time an Iranian in LA was going back to Iran, somebody was approaching them beforehand or afterwards, can you do this, can you do that, or whatnot. They all knew about it. It was very common in the community. Obviously, as I say, the Iranian government knew that because that's how these things are done. So the only people who didn't know it, you know, were the rest of us who were paying the bills for all of this. So that, as I understand it, was how that decision was made. 